and welcome to yet another biography event. I hope that by now many of you have been vaccinated and that all of us are still trying to stay safe and wearing masks and reading 800 page biographies. That's the best protection after all. My name is Kai Bird and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique, in, unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be on March 23rd with Annalyn Swan and Mark Stevens to discuss their new biography of the artist Francis Bacon. They will be in conversation with Michael Kimmelman. The following night on March 24th, I will have a discussion with Timothy Brennan about his biography of Edward Said, Places of Mind. So please mark your calendars. But tonight we are here to honor the celebrated biographer Hermione Lee for her acclaimed new biography, Tom Stoppard, A Life. Coming to us from all across the pond in England, she will be in conversation with Benjamin Taylor, who's sitting in Manhattan. Uh, please look for her biographies online at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. So uh, Hermione Lee is a formidable name among biographers. She was president of Wolfson College from 2008 to 2017 and is Emeritus Professor of English Literature at Oxford. Her work includes biographies of Virginia Woolf, Edith Wharton, and Penelope Fitzgerald. She has also written books on Elizabeth Bowen, Philip Roth, and Willa Cather. She is a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Literature and a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2003, she was made a CBE, and in 2013, she was made a dame for services to literary scholarship. Well, she may be a dame, but I believe her most notable award was when she gave the 2016 Leon Levy Lecture on Biography, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. Benjamin Taylor's new memoir, Here We Are, was published in May 2020. His previous memoir, The Hue and Cry at Our House, received the 2018 Los Angeles Times Christopher Isherwood Prize and was named a New York Times Editor's Choice. His Proust, The Search, was named a Best Book of 2016 by Thomas Milan in the New York Times Book Review and by Robert McCrum in The Guardian. And his Naples Declared a Walk Around the Bay was named a Best Book of 2012 by Judith Thurman in The New Yorker. He is also the author of two novels, Tales Out of School, winner of the 1996 Harold Ribolo Prize, and The Book of Getting Even, winner of a Barnes and Noble Discover Award. Taylor's Bright Medusas, A Life of uh, Willa Cather is scheduled to appear from Viking Press in 2023. Hermione and Benjamin will have a conversation for about 40 minutes and then take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box or the chat box in this Zoom format below to type in your questions. And Benjamin will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. Hermione Lee, congratulations once again on this formidable accomplishment. Benjamin, I now turn the rest of this evening's event <clears throat> over to you. Thank you. Hey, Hermione. Hi, very pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, you've written the definitive biography of Tom Stoppard and it is destined to remain definitive. Uh, it is vast and comprehensive, uh, all-inclusive, and yet with an extraordinary lightness of touch. Somebody once said about Stoppard that he combines weightiness with lightness. I can't remember who exactly it was who said that. You'll, you'll remind me. But uh, uh, the same goes for your marvelous biography of him. Thank you. When I, when I opened it, I came upon, first thing, the uh, extensive family tree. 
which looks like any other family tree until you look more closely and discover how many people in that extended family, both of those extended families, uh, died in 42, 43, and 44. I wonder if you could say more about that. Yes, it's, it's a very extraordinary thing because partly that family tree was not accessible to him um, in his youth. He wouldn't have known those dates, those facts about his family's life, about his, his forebears until much later on. Um, it's a, and the family tree in, on one page, as it were, spells out this, this, extraordinary, uh, this extraordinary history. Uh, when I started work on this book, Stoppard said to me, you'll find I've had a very interesting life up to the age of eight. And it didn't, it wasn't quite right, but I know what he meant. So this is a, a family that was a, a Jewish family in Zlin in, in Czechoslovakia. His father was the Jewish doctor at the Barca uh, Hospital, which was the big international shoe firm, shoemaking firm. Um, when the Nazis invaded, uh, they fled to Singapore. Um, a few years later, uh, the Japanese invaded Singapore. Uh, his father was killed. Eugen Stroessler was killed on a ship trying to get out. His mother, uh, Marta Stroessler, took her two little boys on a terrible journey. Um, they thought they were going to Australia. They ended up in India. The Bacha firm kind of looked after them there. His mother ran the shoe shop in Darjeeling. Uh, where the two boys went to an English, uh, well, an American missionary school where they spoke English. She heard about her father, uh, her husband's death, Tom's father's death, and she remarried an English major, Ken Stoppard, uh, who turned out to be a somewhat xenophobic and anti-Semitic character. And I think she partly married him probably in order to get the boys to safety. And she did get them to safety. They arrived in England uh, when... Tom Stoppard, Thomas Stroessler, or Tomic Stroessler was eight, and he then, as he put it, put on Englishness like a coat. But because his mother, like many people out of those circumstances and of that generation, put her past behind her, wanted to be completely assimilated, wanted the boys to be safe, didn't speak Czech at home, didn't talk about her family and her past, didn't talk about her Jewishness, which to her was not a real thing. She thought of Jewish as religion. Uh, she thought of being Jewish as being religious. She, she thought of Jewishness as the, the Orthodox Jews that they used to see in Zlin, um, dressed in their habits. She was a, a secular person, atheist. Uh, so she never talked about that. And what is more, though she knew that her husband's parents, three of her sisters, um, her parents, her husband's grandmother had all been killed in the Holocaust. She never talked about it. She never said anything about it. And it wasn't until the 90s that Stoppard in his 50s began to find out this story and would then have become able to draft this family tree. These are two extremely dramatic scenes in your book. One takes place in the restaurant at the National Theater and the other in a Prague uh, hotel lobby. Yes. They, they are, one was with his, his cousin, Saka, and one was with another relative um, descended from uh, uh, one of his mother's relations. I met both these people uh, and talked to them. What Stoppard didn't know, and what I found out before he did, actually, was that his mother had been in communication with his cousin, Saka, and had been writing to her. And they arranged to meet. It was actually in the, in the break in rehearsals for Arcadia in, in the restaurant, the National Theatre. And uh, Stoppard met this cousin, not having really known her before. And he started to ask her about the family. He said, Saka, were we Jewish? Hmm. And with a look of absolute astonishment, she said to him, of course we're Jewish. And she then wrote on the napkin of the restaurant table, the family tree. And he asked her what happened to all the people. And she said, Terezin, Riga, Auschwitz. Yeah. And then in a piece that he wrote after his mother died in 99, a piece for Talk magazine, which came out under the title On Turning Out to be Jewish, although I think that wasn't the title he gave it. 
He described that scene and that encounter and also the encounter with Alexander Rosa, um, who also told his story of the silenced past. Um, and that dialogue that he's had with Sarka came into that piece. And then that was in 1999. And then in 2020, he put that exchange into his last play, Leopold Stone. With the line, uh, nobody after all is born at age eight. Nobody, nobody's life begins at the age of eight. And he told me when we were talking about that play, he said I, that he'd written the play in order to put that line into it. Yes. So there is a kind of self-reproach. There is a kind of inheritance of his mother's survivor's guilt. There is a, a, a real turning around that happens in his 80s, in his late life, where he reproaches himself for having been rather uninquiring about this history in previous years, in earlier years. Um, the, the lost include all four grandparents and three aunts and, and others as well. Three aunts, um, three of the grandparents, one great grandparent, and his father, of course, who, who, who died in, that he knew about his father's death. He couldn't remember his father. His fa the grief of his father's death came back to haunt him when he went back to Zlin um, in the 90s and he met a, a woman who as a young girl had cut her wrist in an accident and her and Eugen Dr. Stroessler had sewn up that cut and she showed Stoppard her wrist with the scar on it and he touched the scar and he says that in that moment all the grief that he hadn't felt his father's death came flooding back to him. And that too, a version of that too, is in Leopoldstadt. This is uh, an unimaginably tragic family history from which he was uh, walled off. And it must be said that Stoppard's life is, is a rather triumphant story. Somebody yes. going from strength to strength. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, he uh, let's see, he finds his footing very quickly. He goes straight from secondary school to Bristol, is it? Yes. Where he discovers theater there and yes. Br Bristol Old Vic. So he, as, as his brother rather jealously put it, he donned a trilby and went off into the world. So he didn't take what we call a, what we used to call A-levels, i.e. the sort of second or, you know, senior exams. He left school just after his 17th birthday. And off he went, he sold his school books, his Latin and Greek books, which he might have been going to need actually later on for the invention of love. Um, and he went to Bristol because he went to work in Bristol, his family, his family by then lived in Bristol. Uh, and he just walked into, at that time there were three daily newspapers and one evening newspaper as they were in most thriving provincial English towns. It was the great era in the 1950s of, you know, regional news. And there was the Bristol Old Vic, which is a very important theater. And there was the BBC the documentary arm and, you know, fantastic things going on. And Peter Atul arrived as a sort of dazzling young actor at the Bristol Old Vic. And Tom Stoppard used to run back from his work in the evening to catch Peter Atul doing, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I in Hamlet. Um, and they had a, a nice friendship rather jaunty friendship, I think. And so that was his university. That was his university. And I think you can see in the kind of astonishing self-education and infinite curiosity that pours into the plays, someone who wasn't, as it were, you know, defined by university education. Yes. Um, playwrights are such different creatures from one another uh, and never more so than in rehearsal. Uh, Edward Albee was sweetly uh, uh, imperious. Uh, uh, Pinter was said to be the meanest thing imaginable. Uh, what was, uh, what is Tom Stoppard like in rehearsal? Well, it's a very important question because part of the sort of enormous energy and work drive of his life consists in, as he puts it, looking after his plays. He doesn't just write them and leave them to the mercy of chance. If there are big major productions um, in, the, in, the, in the UK and in the United States, he will go and he will be there, you know, day after day, week after week. Um, and he has a courtly diplomatic relationship with the directors. 
he doesn't want them to feel that he's muscling in, muscling in front of them. Uh, sometimes they get fed up with him being there and send him home, but not often, actually. Mostly they relish his being there. And the extraordinary thing, I had the good luck, this was part of the luck of working on a living writer, I had the good luck to sit in in four lots of rehearsal, two revivals, the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern revival in the 50th anniversary revival at the Old Vic, and the Travesties revival, very brilliant revival done by Patrick Marmot, and then The Hard Problem and uh, Leopoldstown. And with the revivals, it was particularly fascinating because there's the cast of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, including Daniel Radcliffe playing Rosencrantz. And most of them weren't born when this play was first put on. And here is this distinguished, venerable, grand old playwright, and he's changing things and he's answering their questions. Um, unlike Hitler, who when asked, you know, what is a character's motivation would tell people to F off, you know, but Stoppard would never do that. Um, he's politely answering their questions and he's saying, oh, should we give another line to Gertrude here? And things like that. It's quite extraordinary. He doesn't think a text is sacrosanct. What was it like for him seeing Waiting for Godot or uh, the birthday party uh, in Bristol? Um, absolutely revelatory. I mean, I think Beckett was of just a staggering fireworks going off inside his head. Um, there is a very funny account, which I would actually love to read. It's about two, two sentences long of his first meeting with Pinter, oh, yes. which, is, which is at a, a Bristol student drama uh, production of The Birthday Party and Stoppard, who's 24, this is 96, he finds himself sitting just behind Pinter, so he's unable to concentrate on The Birthday Party because he's so taken up with how is he going to introduce himself to Harold Pinter. Uh, at the end of the play, I tapped him on the shoulder and I'm sorry to say, this is Tom, spoke to him as follows, are you Harold Pinter or do you only look like him? He turned round and I got an early inkling of Harold Pinter's unflinching, unswerving gaze. He said, what? I don't remember anymore. Perhaps I fainted. But he went, he went on to not only become good friends with Pinter, which is very interesting because Pinter was famously rebarbative and indeed quite violent in his arguments with people. Um, they always treated each other with friendship and respect because politically they were very different. And that was, that was interesting. But also Stoppard always says of Pinter as of Beckett, that he felt unlike himself, that Pinter radically changed what you could do with drama. And that radical change was to get rid of the backstory. That is, not only do you not know what happened before the play starts or why they're all there, but the author doesn't know. There is no hinterland, it's just what you see. And for Stoppard, that was completely puzzling and brilliant. Quite impossible on the basis of the first scene of the, of, uh, the real thing or of Arcadia to know what's really afoot. Well, that's another matter. He likes to ambush his audiences. He likes to bring them into a world very suddenly and dramatically where you have a clue what's going on. So at the beginning of Travis's, you know, Lenin is, is talking Russian, Joyce is dictating Ulysses, Tristan Tsar is making up a piece of Dadaism. It's a problem, um, and only gradually do you, do you realise. And then the beginning of the real thing, as I, it's not a spoiler because I think everyone knows this, the first scene you think is the drama of people's lives. And then in the second scene, you find out that was a play. A play with him. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, the, uh, the extraordinary success and, and cr critical and commercial success of this uh, new kind of theater he produced did have its detractors and they, they're present in your book too. For example, uh, the head of the Royal Court known for its leftist stance on everything said, our philosophy here at the Royal Court is never to put on a play by Tom Stoppard. <laughs> In the end, they did, of course, they put on rock and roll. And that same person resigned from the board of directors at that point because rock and roll was being put on. Well, this is a complicated story and it's about the way in which Stoppard was seen, has been seen as an establishment figure. And one can well understand, given the childhood that we've been talking about, 
uh, given that he didn't go back to Czechoslovakia under a communist regime, as the character in Rock and Roll does, who, by the way, was originally going to be called Thomas, um, he constantly compares his the luck of the draw, the luck of the fall of the coin, and his having ended up in a free country with a free press, habeas corpus, um, uh, where and looking across at Eastern Europe in the 70s and 80s, uh, he saw writers like himself, artists like himself, who were not free to speak, who were not who were not free to put on their play. And so, his attitude to the left in Britain, you know, the radical left, the radical revolutionary left that I, you, you know, that you and I grew up grew up with, uh, who thought of bourgeois democracy as a form of fascism, and actually that's partly Pinter's arguments uh, too found negligible these arguments because he was thinking about places where real real lack of freedom was taking place and so his relationship with Václav Havel and his close connection to Charter 77 and what was going on in Czechoslovakia in the in the 70s and his his enlist his being enlisted to the cause of Soviet Jewry and Soviet refuseniks in the 80s and then much later for the Belarus Free Theatre all comes yeah. out of that. So I think calling him right wing, as some people have done, and as that guy at the Royal Court did, it doesn't, it doesn't quite cover it. People used to call Saul Bellow right wing, but I always thought of him more as a lone wolf, politically. Yeah. yeah. Well, lone... Stoppard, Stoppard is less of a lone wolf, I would have thought, than, than, than Bellow, in that Stoppard is unarguably part of the British establishment. Uh, you know, he's he's got his knighthood and his order of merit and he knows people in every, you know. The thing about him as a person, I'm talking about him personally rather than as a writer just for a second, he, he, is, uh, he doesn't treat people differently. He's completely the same, whoever he's talking to. It's a marked thing. Uh, he, some, he summed up his uh, anti-communist liberalism in more than one place by saying uh, this, the sins in, of the West are the system failing to deliver, failing to be up to its ideal of itself, whereas the sins uh, of the communist bloc are the system working at full tilt. Yes, that's, that's exactly, uh, that's a wonderful example of how his epigrammatic bent can meet his deep feelings about. Uh, he also thinks, and he says this, I think it's a line in The Real Thing and elsewhere, actually, he says that he thinks that public positions are a function of private defamations or, you know, that, that public political positions always have some basis in temperament and they, and they always have some moral, uh, you know, he thinks of politics with a small p as a, as a kind of morality. He thinks that ultimately, Plain speech, true speech, free speech is, is what really, really matters, which is why he's so, uh, why the free press is so important to him. Yes. We haven't yet talked about uh, my own favorite among his plays, The Invention of Love. It's my favorite too. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Why? It actually, funnily enough, is his favorite as well, interestingly, although it didn't do nearly as well as many of the great plays like Arcadia. Um, I'm very moved by the double meetings of um, the dry, critical Latin scholar and translator and the deeply yearning, poignant, thwarted, unexpressed homosexual who pours out his unexpressed feelings in these wonderful lyric poems. Um, so that's one sort of, you know, tension. Uh, and I also love the other tension, if you think of it, the sort of cross uh, between the old houseman about to be ferried across the River Styx by Karen um, and the young houseman. And there's a marvellous encounter between them. And then there's also a third kind of uh, doubling in a way, which is that but uh, an it entirely imaginary encounter between Hausman and Wilde. And many people thought that Wilde gets the better of that encounter, but it's not. It's it's the shy, reserved, haughted, uh, uh, not the exhibitionist person who gets the better of the argument. Some people have said about that play, uh, 
Hausman seems to be the hero, but Lyle turns out to be the hero, but there's no reason why they can't both. No. Well, and also if you think about the kind of dialogues that we're so familiar with in, in Stoppard's work, for instance, in travesties between um, uh, Joyce and Tristan Zara, um, or, you know, between Henry and the, the, the woman he loves in, in the real thing, all sides get to speak. You know, one of the things that makes Stoppard a playwright and not a novelist or a poet uh, is that he loves to do things in different voices. He loves the eloquence and daring of inhabiting opposite points of view. Uh, there was a name that came up importantly in your book that was new to me, uh, a playwright that, uh, a little known playwright, at least on these shores, little known, named James Saunders, who was... Yes. In, in, instrumental for uh, there's uh, a play called Next Time I'll Sing to You, which was very, which I don't think anybody reads or sees now. It's a sort of rather odd surrealist play, um, but uh, but it clearly had a very important effect on him when he was a, when he was very young, when he was just start when he was really starting work on Rosencrantz in uh, at a fellowship in in Germany. Saunders was one of the tutors there and. Uh, they would talk to each other a lot. And there's a line, I've heard him use this line, seen and heard him use this line through the whole of his life, actually, uh, which is a line from that play, Next Time I'll Sing to You. And the line goes, there lies behind everything a certain quality which we may call grief. And I find that very telling in that one of the things I suppose I was trying to do in the book was to perhaps push against this constant discovery of the critics decade after decade that, oh, Tom Stoppard has a heart. Oh, goodness, he's writing about a feeling. You know, and you would get this with the real thing, you get this in Arcadia, you get this with Invention Love, and then you got it again with Leopold Stoppard. And actually, if you go back to Rosencrantz or some of the wonderful radio plays of that time, like the school union play called Where Are They Now? or Artists Ascending a Staircase. There, there is an underlying grief in those plays. I think Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's helplessness and amusement and the sense of mortality and the sense of not knowing what to do and what, or not knowing what's going to happen to you. We know what's going to happen to them because it's in the title. What? What is it in that, those last, uh, that moment, about five minutes from the end of Arcadia, that causes audiences routinely to start to solve? Uh, I've, I, it's happened to me at, at the University of Chicago. I saw this happen, and I saw it in a repertory company in St. Louis. There is a certain moment of realization that causes people to begin to cry en masse. Yes, and even when you're just sitting alone in your room, too, I can tell you. Um, yes. It's, it's partly because you're reeling from the shock. I don't want to give this away in case by bizarre chance anyone in the audience hasn't seen Arcadia, but there is a death to which Arcadia leads up and, uh, and which is very shocking to the audience. And so you're reeling from that, but also the, two, the whole play takes place, I'm sure everybody knows this in fact, takes place in this one room where two times are playing out and one of the, the 18th, late 18th century and the 20th, mid 20th century. And one of the pleasures um, uh, of the play is seeing the modern characters getting everything wrong yes. about the past, desperately like biographers, you know, desperately questing for the right piece of paper and, <laughs> and wildly misinterpreting them. But then at the end, there's a fancy dress ball uh, and there's a dance. And the two times fuse together and the final clues do come through and the two couples are dancing on stage. And it's, I actually, I put in a, a, a couplet from, from Burnt Norton because I thought that that sense that Eliot gives you, Eliot being a very important influence on, on Stoppard of time past and time present. You know, going around again. I wish I hadn't put that question actually, because quoting from Eliot is a very expensive business. Oh. Oh. It must also be expensive to go all the way to Darjeeling uh, 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 to run your finger along the ridge of a wall. We uh, should explain that maybe. Yes, I had a wonderful time in Darjeeling. I did that sort of very much towards the end of the writing. It was my last footsteps moment. Um, when when Stoppard's about seven. 
he's in his school in Darjeeling, and although these terrible things have happened, uh, he nevertheless feels secure and happy. And he remembers vividly this moment when he's walking along the corridor of the school in, in Darjeeling, and he runs his finger along the sort of dividing ridge along the middle of the wall and feels a sense of complete happiness and security. And so, I, yes, I, my husband and I went all the way to Darjeeling in order that I could go into the school and there's the corridor and there's the wall and there's the ridge along the wall. And so I did the right biographer's thing, which was to run my finger along. Armani, is there a, is there a passage? Is there a passage of the book that you'd be willing to read to yes, us? Yes, I'd love to. Um, uh, thank you very much, Ben. We've been talking about, uh, we started by talking about the family tree and the way the history comes back to haunt him. So I may say that I didn't know when I started the book, of course, that he was going to be writing another play as I was trying to finish my book. Um, this is the inconvenience and also the great beauty and excitement of writing about um, a, a living writer who goes on writing. And so I added, I had to add a, a, the last chapter to keep pace with the writing of Leopold Sturt. Uh, so, and this is how the last chapter begins. Time and again, he had talked about his good luck. He told people that he had had a charmed life and a happy childhood. Even though he was taken from his home as a baby in wartime, his father was killed and many members of his family, as he later discovered, were murdered by the Nazis. This narrative had become part of his performance, his built-in way of thinking and talking about himself. And that story of a charmed life was profoundly connected to his sense of luck in having become English. A patriotic gratitude and a pleasure in belonging to his adoptive country which in contrast to many other places was a free country, was the lifelong outcome of his childhood luck. A charmed life seems a highly appropriate phrase for him too, not that he would put it like this, because of his own charm. Charm is a difficult word. It usually makes a person sound shady, glib, superficial, manipulative. If it's possible to redeem the word, you'd want in his case to talk about deep charm, a charm that comes from attention, kindness, intelligence, humour, physical charisma, as well as glamour, and also charm as a form of concealment. It does work as a kind of defence and a means of persuasion. He knows what effect he has on people. Charm is also a vital characteristic of his work, and charm in its sense of spell or enchantment, like the charms that Prospero says goodbye to, having set Ariel free at the end of the Tempest, is the secret of Stoppard's profession, the magical thing that happens in the theatre, hard to say quite how or why, it's a mystery. But his sense of having had a charmed life has its dark side too. Luck, the fall of a coin, plays a big part in his plays, as in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Some of his characters get away with it and get lucky. They escape the war to the blessed zone of Swiss neutrality. They visit an oppressed Eastern European country, but are free to go home again. They find the person they love at the very end of the play by accident or coincidence. But there are as many characters who don't have any luck. They don't know who they are or what they are supposed to do. They are uncertain and confused and they never get any answers. They are far from home in exile with no hope of return. They do not get their heart's desire. They do not escape the worst of history. They die bewildered or too soon. As he came into old age, his sense of his charmed life underwent a retrospective shift. Of course, there had been profound changes before that. His thoughts about his own history and the way he used it in his work had been altered by his friendship with Havel, by finding out the facts of his Jewishness and returning to Czechoslovakia in the 1990s and by his mother's death. But in his 80s, the past came back for him in a different way, entailing some pain and self-reproach. He was a person and a writer for whom kin and kinship had always mattered deeply, a family man. And he was thinking more and more about his kin, his family history, and the responsibility he owed it. He had rethought many times what it meant to be Czech, to be an Eastern European child turned Englishman. 
Now, as can happen in old age, his history and his family's past became increasingly a preoccupation. What had once been obliterated came back to haunt him. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions, if you're willing to entertain them. Sure, whatever. Anyone, anybody refuse to speak to you? Anyone refuse to speak to me? That, question, that question comes from Michelle Willens. Some, some, one person refused to speak to me. Um, and then two years on, she changed her mind. Um, and I don't know why, and I'm not gonna say who it was, uh, but I'm very, very glad that she did speak to me. Uh, it made an enormous difference. But the other side of that question is actually about the paper trail, which is very interesting to me. Papad is poised between being a paper person and a virtual person, as it were. I mean, he texts and, you know, he sort of does email. Um, but, but he's not, you know, he's not out there on any kind of social media. But, I, but I, he's a great letter writer. And I know very well that there are letters out there, um, love letters, letters to friends, which I uh, haven't seen. And I'm not surprised I haven't seen them because if you're in the middle of living your life, you might not want to give your letters to the biographer. Um, that's your life as well as the subject's life. Now, in 50 years time, there may be another life of Stoppard which, which will be able to obtain some of those documents because they'll be in archive. Yes. But I had the advantage of talking to him. Uh, Douglas Bell asks the following, uh, Miss Lee, how would you characterize the atmosphere and connection between John le Carré and Stoppard during the writing and production of Ah, uh, of the Russia House? We haven't yet mentioned yes. the, the large number of uh, film scripts that Stoppard yes. has also written. That, that's a good question. That's, that was the beginning of his friendship with David Cornwell. Um, I don't actually think that uh, David Cornwell thought terribly highly of Stoppard's script screenplay of the Russia House and I think what happened is that <laughs> Cornwall tried to sort of take it back I think and 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 revise it so um, that wasn't necessarily the best part of their relationship but what was great was that uh, I mean by the way doing the Russia House and thinking about the Cold War and and spying and all that gave Stoppard very good ammunition for for instance Hapgood um, but in terms of that relationship, it's, a, it's very interesting. I'm, one of my most moving and interesting interviews that I did for this book was with David Cornwall uh, a couple of years before he, he died. And he told me he felt a great affinity to Stoppard, partly because he, Cornwall, famously had an aberrant father who was sort of intolerable and kept disappearing. And, and Stoppard's father had gone. Uh, and he could barely remember him. Um, and he felt that that fatherlessness and that sense of not being quite at home in the country where you are um, drew them together. And he also felt, he told me, that he, he recognised a kind of sense of darkness in Stoppard, which they never talked about, but he thought it was rather akin uh, to his own feelings about life. And maybe it goes back to that underlying sense of grief. What we haven't talked about sort of be funny writer. I'm, I'm sorry. We haven't talked about what a fantastically funny writer yes. Stoppard is, but underneath that azzle of brilliance and wit and that makes your sides ache when you're watching a funny play by Stoppard, there is a kind of, yes, there is a kind of dark place. Well, was he in touch with others uh, besides Le Carre, other of the uh, uh, great uh, fiction writers that emerged in the 50s, like Golding or Iris Murdoch or uh, Muriel Spark, or were, was the theater culture uh, really yeah. separate from the fictional culture? It's a, it's, it's a good question, and I think the answer is no, actually. I can't find any trace of that. The people he was really, really interested in the 50s in terms of fiction writing and also playwriting were not the English novelists, but the American novelists. And uh, he had a very interesting early encounter with Steinbeck, for instance, who as a young journalist, he went to interview Steinbeck and Steinbeck said, go away, I don't want to be interviewed. So 
Stoppard very politely went, started to go away instead of doorstepping him. And Steinbeck was so amazed and, and you know, touched by this that he said, oh, no, come on, I'll, I'll, I'll do an interview with you. So there is an interesting early Steinbeck Stoppard interview. And um, Hemingway was one of the great heroes of his life. He, he passionately regretted never having met Hemingway. But the big heroes for him, yeah, were Beckett, and Pinter, Arthur Miller also was a was an enormous hero for him. I haven't seen any trace of him showing any interest in a writer such as Murdoch. Murdoch. <laughs> what about the figure who was, who was in some ways uh, preeminent in the British post-war theater for a time, uh, Osborne? Yes, I mean, I think they knew each other. I don't get the sense that there's any particular uh, relationship or particular fondness there. The interest to me about someone like Osborne, um, I mean, clearly it was an important part of post-war theater for Stoppard and he could see the things that were changing uh, with a play like Look Back in Anger. But I think what's, what's very interesting is, is how autobiographical Osborne is, how much he lets his own character and emotions pour onto the stage in his plays and how not like that Stoppard is, how even even when you get to rock and roll or or the real the playwright in the real thing um, or Leopold Stark where there is this piece of his past in it, he's not writing confessionally at all and that's I think very unlike Osborne, rather unlike David Hare for instance with whom he's also friends. I have a question <laughs> from the writer Peter Orner who says, I'm a fan of your glorious biography of Penelope Fitzgerald. Thank I wonder you. if you see any, if you see any connections between Stoppard and Fitzgerald. <laughs> One had a harder life than the other. It was, in terms of being the biographer, there was some, there was a bit of training went on writing about Penelope Fitzgerald, because I had known her a bit and interviewed her. Um, and, but I was asked to write the biography by her grown up children after she had died. So um, I did I did have some training in negotiating with and talking to the family and uh, and living friends. I mean um, all of whom were actually very helpful. I can't think of a more different life. It, you know on the one hand you've got a playwright who leaps to fame and success in his 20s. On the other hand you've got a woman who spends most of her adult life completely obscure uh, as a teacher and in living in difficult conditions, bringing up her children and she doesn't publish her, she doesn't really get going until she's 60. Um, you also on the one hand have an in intensely uh, gregarious, high profile, sociable, outgoing um, uh, person with a million friends. And on the other side of the coin, you have a rather self-concealing private, somewhat obscure personality, extremely evasive, she used to lie to interviewers, you know, and, and the work is also very different. So I was delighted with the completeness of these two people. Um, Deborah Solomon uh, asks here in New York, uh, uh, how much time are you willing to spend pursuing a subject who initially declines to be interviewed for a book? I, this is, I, I think this is somebody speaking out of a professional experience. Uh, uh, do reluctant subjects ever change their minds? I'm not, a, a, like Stoppard with Steinbeck, I'm, I'm, I'm probably the kind of person who's gonna go, oh, okay, sorry, I'll go away now, um, rather than putting my foot in the door. I, I, um, I had the advantage of network of English life that is, you know, literary and social and, and theatrical. And so I, I knew some people already and I came to know far more people by, by working on Stop On. One of the excitements of doing the book was to talk to such interesting people. So I, I sort of went slightly round the houses and, and would say to one or two friends, please tell her that I'm not going to be horrible. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to be more horrible than I have to be, as it were. You know, please, please ask her if she'll think again. So it, there was a certain amount of circuitousness uh, around it. But if somebody slams the door on you and says, 
no, I'm not going to show you my letters. No, I don't want to talk to you about this. Then I, I'm going to leave a gap because I think ultimately, you, I, I think you've got to be delicate when you're dealing with a living person. I mean, he wasn't, he, when we were talking, there was nothing that was off limits. Um, he wasn't evasive and he wasn't secret. I'm sure there are things he didn't tell me. Um, the, the thing that, one thing he was, wanted me to be careful about and quite rightly, I thought, and this is another example of how I think you have to be respectful of living people, uh, were the, his grown-up sons. He has four grown-up sons, one of whom is the actor Ed Stoppard, who actually is playing a part in this last production of Leopoldstadt. And of course they needed to play a part in the story when they're growing, when they're little, because I wanted to show Stoppard as father and a family man. That's an important part, very important part of his character. And as they grow up and have their own problems and their own lives and their own families, that's, that's not my subject. I'm not writing their biographies. Uh, we haven't mentioned two very important actresses in his life, Sinead Cusack and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, Penelope, uh, Felicity Kendall. Felicity Kendall is who mm. I think of. Uh, but sh something from some, a painful story, very private, from Sh Sinead Cusack's past becomes material in which play is it? The, uh, yes, uh, oh, she, the, she was one of, of the, yeah, she was one of the last, um, she was one of the last generation in Ireland. She's an Irish actress who, who had a, what was sometimes known as a shame baby, who gave up a, a, gave up a child for adoption. And, and then, you know, she left Ireland. She had a, has had a, and has a brilliant career. She um, married Jeremy Irons. They have two, two children. Um, but she had always meant to and intended to try and find her son. And the law changed in a way that um, became, made that more possible. And at the time that she and Stoppard were in a relationship, she did find her grown up son who turned out to be a, 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 a radical left wing Irish politician, a political figure. And it, the combination of her own family and that rediscovery and her relationship with Tom and her career simply became, you know, too, too, too complicated, too, too onerous. And that's, that's a story of great joy to her, but also of sadness. Yes, and it figures in the hard problem. In, in the hard problem, the, the main uh, woman character has given up a child for adoption and the whole, uh, and finds her again. Uh, and the whole debate in that play about um, materialism and what consciousness consists of and whether there is such a thing as being able to pray, uh, you know, and what would you be praying to if you were praying and why would you pray? And the whole sense of whether there's more, more to life uh, than, as it were, functioning mechanical materialism which is the debate, that is the central debate, that is the hard problem. Um, what is the nature of consciousness? Uh, the, the plot of the mother and the child uh, is the plot which, which, which is the hook for that whole debate in that way, which I think we saw on the same night in- Which we ran into the lobby, with Jean Strauss, exactly. Jean Strauss is with us, by the way. Hello, Jean. Hello, Jean. Uh, Marilyn Wyatt writes, could you kindly comment on Stoppard's relationship with Václav Havel uh, and any influence that Havel might have had on Stoppard's art and thinking? It's a tremendously important question um, and it fills the central part of his life so that um, as he became more and more involved uh, with what was going on in his home country, in his the country of his birth in the 1970s. Uh, Havel became a tremendously potent presence to him. He had started simply by admiring the plays. The plays really attracted him. They were just the kind of odd, quirky, linguistically playful, surrealist plays that, that you know, that just 
his funny bone. Um, and so he started by admiring him as a playwright. He then became deeply absorbed in his predicament as a, as a, as a member, of the, an artist should become a member of the resistance. Um, and there is a very strong feeling in Stoppard, and he spells it out in his, in his panels about thinking of, of Havel um, as a kind of alter ego to him. And he writes passionately in his journals to himself about how, you know, Václav Havel, a man whose mother did not marry into British democracy, has just been charged with high treason for which the, for which the company may be 15 years in prison. He writes an astonishingly moving letter to Havel in 1984. He's just gone to the University of Toulouse to take an honorary degree on his behalf because Havel is under surveillance and house arrest. And he writes him a letter in which he says that he has had a terrible dream in which he thinks he's been thrown into jail for several years and it's his first day in jail and he's in complete despair and he's in this dream and he knows it's a dream and he, but he can't get out of it. And then he wakes up, one of his sons comes in and wakes him up because it's time for him to go to school. And he says to Havel, um, I woke up with a sense of enormous relief at being in my own home and in my own bed. And then I immediately thought of you. And I thought, what would I do? What would I do if I were in your, your situation? <clears throat> Out of that comes rock and roll, I think. Yes. Um, let's see, there's, there's, there's a very good question uh, from uh, Leah Bender. Uh, how much of a Joycean was, uh, is Tom Stoppard? He's, he's interested in Joyce. He loves Ulysses and he makes a pitch for Ulysses, of course, in, very famously in, in Travesties. You know, what would the battle of the, 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 the Greeks against the Trojans have been um, if it hadn't been for Ulysses? Dust. Um, and that's a great speech in, in, uh, that Joyce he gives Joyce to, to make. My feeling is that the really strong modernist influence on Stoppard in his 20s uh, was Eliot rather than Joyce. Um, I mean, I've already talked a bit about Hemingway and, you know, he's also very keen on people like Cummings and Ferber and lots and lots of interesting um, modern American, 20th century American writers. But Eliot, he, Tom showed me a little black notebook that he'd kept uh, in the early 60s, and it has bits of his mid 60s. It has lots of aphorisms and lots of quotes and lots of bits of his novel that he's writing, which he thought was going to be a huge success. He thought Rosencrantz was going to be a flop, and his novel, Lord Malquist and Mr. Moon, was going to be a great success. They came out on the same day, but actually, history tells us otherwise. But in that notebook, there are bits from Rosencrantz mixed up with bits from the novel. And then there are lots of quotes from Prufrock and other early uh, Eliot poems. And it's clear that Eliot is absolutely in his psyche. Yes. yes. Um, uh, Judith, Judith yes. Murray uh, writes, uh, you used the word footsteps. Was that a reference to Richard Holmes's method yes. of biographical writing? It was. Richard Holmes is a great hero of mine, and that's well picked up. And he has that lovely book, Footsteps, Adventures of a Romantic Biographer, where he describes, you know, pretending to be Robert Louis Stevenson walking through the sewer, and only he has a hat instead of a donkey. And he has a very beautiful image for what biography can do. That is when you're writing biography of dead subjects, past subjects. He says it's like the broken bridge at Avignon that you can go so far, you can get to the edge, the end of the broken bridge, but you can't quite cross over into the past. And it's out of that, that broken bridge, that distance that biography is made. There are two, <coughs> two deans of modern British biography. You're one and he's the other. I don't want to be a dean. Uh, <laughs> you've, already, you've already been a uh, university <laughs> president. So. Um, <laughs> there's a uh, oh yes, there's a question about the, uh, the research he did for Leopoldstadt. What that he did about? that he did for Leopoldstadt. Yes, it's it's. Uh, I think he started thinking about this 
play around 2015, 2016, maybe. And he read, as he always does, I mean, we never talked about why Invention of Love was his favourite play. And he always says, it's because I so love the research I was doing for that play and I didn't want to stop doing the research and start writing the play. And so he always reads hugely. Um, and he read all around uh, the memoirs and histories of Jews in Vienna, assimilated Jews in Vienna, and all around the Austro-Hungarian world. I mean, it's interesting that in, you know, much earlier on, he was doing free translations and adaptations of playwrights such as Schnitzler. And that world, that Jewish, witty, sophisticated, cosmopolitan, uh, Austro-Hungarian world is very, very attractive to him. And in fact, Schnitzler has a sort of offstage part in, in Leopoldstadt. And so he read, oh, Stefan Zweig and Edmund de Waal and lots and lots of books on, on the history of the Jews in Europe. And he also very tellingly read um, the memoirs of Wittgenstein, the Wittgensteins. And there's a very dramatic and telling moment after the Anschluss when Paul Wittgenstein comes into the room white as a sheet and says to his sister, we count as Jews. And that's the story of Leopoldstadt, actually. That's, that's the crux of it. We feel very deprived of that play. Uh, it will come back. I, I believe it will come back, yeah. And I, I hope it will come to... You saw, you saw performances and rehearsals. I saw rehearsals. I saw him... I saw the actors and, and the author weeping in rehearsals. And Stoppard said, is it all right for me to cry at my own play? Mm. Um, and I saw, it was very, I saw two, uh, I saw a preview and I saw two productions um, before it went dark. And it was very extraordinary, actually, because no sooner did people rise from their seats at the end of the play than that they would start talking about their own family histories. Yes. Thank you so much, Hermione Lee. Thank you, Ben. It's been such a treat. Wonderful. And thank all of you for having joined us. Um, go read the book. You won't be sorry. Thank you to everyone. Thanks, everyone.